Hey everyone, it looks like we've got a couple of people already logged on. Uh, we'll get started at three o'clock Eastern time sharp. Um, but while I have you here as a captive audience, um, if you could just let me know whether or not you can uh, hear me well and see my screen. I'm flipping through the first couple of slides now. Um, if you could just go into the questions box and just type yes or no there, that would be a huge help to me while we're waiting on everyone. All right, thank you guys so much. Um, so I'm just going to put myself on mute for another minute or two. You can uh, just relax and we will get started in just a few minutes. All right, hello everyone and welcome to our webinar on moving your spring fundraiser online. Uh, my name is Linda Gerhardt and I am the Senior Community Engagement Manager here at Mighty Cause. I've been with Mighty Cause since 2016 and before joining uh, this company I actually worked in the nonprofit sector. Um, this was actually my first job in a long time that was outside of the nonprofit sector so I feel for what you guys are going through right now um, and if you need to contact me about any specific fundraising situations that you are facing um, my email address is on this slide it's Linda at MightyCause.com and I'm always down and available to chat about fundraising strategies um, and particularly marketing and communications. Here is a quick look at today's agenda and I just wanted to briefly mention that I had this whole other webinar planned for this week where I was planning to talk about some really great spring fundraisers we've had on our platform and leave you inspired to start planning your spring charity walk or fun run but obviously I needed to adjust course with all of the recent events and all of the events being canceled. Um, I don't think there's a way for me to cover every single possible fundraising scenario that nonprofits are facing right now but I'm hopeful um, that the content of this webinar addresses some of your biggest challenges and concerns and can leave you with some solid ideas and action items for adjusting course for this spring and staying funded through this really rocky period. Um, as a bit of housekeeping, I will be taking questions at the end of the presentation. Um, so if you think of something you'd like to ask or a topic you'd like to chat through a bit more while I'm talking, um, just type that into the questions box of your GoToWebinar panel and we'll make sure to get to it after I'm through with the presentation. 
All right, so we're going to start off by talking about fundraising during a pandemic. Um, you're also going to notice a lot of baby animals in this slide deck. Um, I initially put them in there um, as placeholders until I figured out what kind of imagery was appropriate, but I decided to just leave them in because I think we need more calm, serene, cute pictures of animals and fewer scary pictures of the coronavirus put through 20 different layers of grunge in Photoshop to make it look extra spooky and threatening or empty shelves at, shelves at grocery stores. So these pictures make me happy. Um, I'm not trying to downplay the situation, but as I was building this webinar, I was like, you know, we could use some cute kittens and puppies right now. So that's the reason for the baby animals. Um, so I don't want to spend a ton of time dwelling on the negative here, um, but I do want to go over why uh, this pandemic is such a big deal and what the challenges and fears are um, that nonprofits are facing. Um, first, because of social distancing, um, that spring event that nonprofits like yours have been working on and planned and looking forward to and have already invested in in some cases can't actually happen um, because of limits on gatherings. They need to be canceled or postponed indefinitely or it completely reimagined. Um, so that fundraising plan and calendar you put together just months ago with projections about how much money you'd be bringing in and donations, that's been completely turned on its head. And we literally have no idea how long this will last because this situation is basically completely unprecedented in our lives. Uh, many nonprofits have had to press pause on their fundraising efforts and throw themselves and all of their resources into serving their communities to help them get through this, which can place an even bigger strain on their finances and they don't have the resources right now to focus on fundraising. Um, and finally, the experts are saying that we're headed toward a recession um, and anytime there's an economic downturn or crisis, the nonprofit sector really braces for impact because if people are broke and the economy is bad, then we worry about the effects on charitable giving. Um, so this is just a summary of all of the uh, fears and, and, and trials that we've been hearing about at Mighty Cause since this whole situation kind of put uh, our country at a pause. But there is good news, and I want to spend a little bit more time dwelling on that because in times like these, we tend to immerse ourselves in fear, but there's actually quite a bit of good to concentrate on right now. Um, first of all, most modern nonprofits are already utilizing digital fundraising channels like Mighty Cause to raise money for their platforms because online fundraising and marketing is just part of the nonprofit landscape in 2020. So as a sector, we are well set up to adjust to this new fundraising landscape where we can't have big gatherings of people um, because for many nonprofits, the actual giving is actually happening online anyway, and the in-person stuff is just a, a cool bonus. It's not necessary for the process of fundraising and charitable giving. Um, and nonprofit donors are on the whole completely on board with digital giving, um, with most of them accepting it as the standard. So it's really not much of an adjustment for most donors. They're already giving online and they will continue to give online. Um, and one of the things that is always really Really cool to see when things are bad and it's scary and in general things seem like they're falling apart is that people really want to help they're looking for ways to help and we're already seeing that happen organically on mighty cause we've seen people putting together lists of nonprofits for their community that they can circulate and ask people to support them um, people are starting relief funds for restaurant workers and artists and other people who whose ability to make a living has been impacted by social distancing and isolation um, and the helpers of the world are already springing into action to proactively help. And they're spreading the word and supporting organizations that are doing good work. So we're already seeing this and it's really only been a little over a week or so. So the helpers are already springing into action and it's really amazing to see and there's even more good news. Um, so this situation is really not like the Great Recession of 2008, um, but there were studies done on the effect of recessions and economic downturns on charitable giving as a result of the Great Recession. And what they found was actually that economic ups and downs and changes are much more moderate for the nonprofit sector than they are the overall economy. So when the economy as a whole or the stock market takes a nosedive, charitable giving might take a small spill. Um, and when the economy recovers, charitable giving gets a moderate boost. But it's really not as 
drastic or dramatic um, for charitable giving as it is for other areas of the economy. Um, so that can be a small comfort if you're worried about a recession. I was certainly working for a nonprofit in 2008, and those were tough times. Um, but generally, what we see is that your your sector nonprofits don't take as big of a hit as other industries. Um, the other thing we know is that charitable giving has been trending toward digital philanthropy and fundraising for more than a decade. And each year it only increases. And that's a big difference I wanna harp on because when the recession hit, as I mentioned, I was out there, I was working at a nonprofit. Most of our revenue came from cash and checks and a few big fundraising events each year where we literally had a room full of volunteers who were opening envelopes and counting cash from that event. But the space of online giving at that point in time wasn't quite there, the technology wasn't there yet, but right now uh, nonprofits have a plethora of really great platforms to choose from and they're already set up on those platforms. So this is not as much of a shift to move away from those envelopes of cash and those events to just fundraising online digitally. Um, and one thing we've actually seen is that in some, that some types of nonprofits actually see a bump in charitable giving when there's a crisis. So medical organizations, food pantries, and so on are actually likely to see a little bit of an increase in giving because their services and the need for them in their community is becoming more visible. So um, next, on segueing off of that, I wanted to talk a little bit about marketing and public relations during this pandemic. So when you get down to it, even though this situation is very unfamiliar to most of us, this is just basic crisis management, right? Um, so let's go through what that means and how this kind of thing is normally dealt with. Um, first, leadership of your organization will need to get, get together and make some tough decisions, um, which you may have already done at this point, but you'll want to include your executive director, your director of development, your operations managers, and then just make a plan. Um, what are you doing with your spring event? Are you canceling? Are you postponing it? Are you going to go back to the drawing board and totally reimagine it? Um, if you have public hours, what are you doing? Are you staying open to the public on a limited basis? Um, are you an essential um, are you an essential organization that is allowed to stay open? Um, what are your staffing needs and can people stay home and work remotely or do you need essential staff to come in? Um, if there's an increase in demand for your services, how are you managing that? How are you keeping your staff safe? And all that good stuff. And then you'll just need to sketch out a plan for disseminating that in information with both your constituents, your board of directors, your staff, and as well as your volunteers, especially if you have an active volunteer base who's likely looking to you to know how they can help. Um, so just make sure that everybody knows um, what their role, what's happening and what their role in it is and how they can assist. Um, one of the biggest public relations tips I can give you about managing a crisis at a nonprofit, whatever that crisis may be, is to be honest. When you're honest and transparent about your situation as an organization, it builds trust in your organization. It builds your reputation and your credibility. So you'll want to be frank in how you discuss how coronavirus is affecting your operations, what you're doing, you need to share the facts with them, and also discuss what you're doing to protect your staff, protect your volunteers, volunteers and what you're doing in your community um, to serve your community and your constituency. Um, we highly recommend that you make this communication as personal as possible, um, as in a personal message from your executive director to make it feel even more honest and transparent and one-to-one, -one, um, which you can actually see modeled for you in the landslide of emails everyone is getting from the CEO of every single company who's ever had your email address um, telling you how they're responding to the virus. Another thing that can be really effective is doing a Facebook Live or a video um, with your, your executive director or a figurehead at your organization sort of talking about these issues so that you're communicating with the public. You'll also want to make sure that you're proactive here. Um, give everyone involved, your stakeholders, your sponsors, attendees, ticket holders, donors, volunteers, and so on, as much notice as you possibly possibly can, and think through the logistics so you can get ahead of any questions that might come in. For instance, um, questions about refunds for ticket sales for your spring event, which we're going to talk about more in depth a little bit later. Um, and if you're 
still in discussion at your nonprofit, it's also completely fine to just say, hey, we're still talking about this and we're going to be in touch as soon as we have more information. But basically, you don't want the public to have to come to you and ask you what you're doing. That erodes trust. It makes it seem like you're hiding something or you're neglecting to do something. So being proactive here is definitely what is recommended. Um, and again, public safety is the name of the game here. So talk about what steps you're taking to keep everyone safe and also discuss how coronavirus is impacting things for you. Like what's different at your organization? What's changed? Do you have different hours? Um, do you have an organization where staff still needs to report every single day? How are you keeping them safe and so on? So knowing these things will help proactively build trust in the community. And right now I do recommend trying to keep things hopeful as much as possible. People are feeling a lot of panic and anxiety right now. People are getting burned out by the news cycle and by the millions of emails they get every single day about the virus. So just be mindful of that and try to deliver a message of hope. That's something that nonprofits do really well. Um, focus on the helpers, things your staff and volunteers are doing to serve the community, um, inspiring moments you've seen play out because times like these are really when we often see those amazing little stories of humanity that drive home what our nonprofits do. Um, and I'm not saying you have to use baby animals like I did in this webinar, um, but just try to choose images that convey a sense of hope, like people uh, you know, at a food pantry unloading food, um, something like that, accepting deliveries, um, people helping at your, your premises, um, and not like pictures of crowded hospitals overseas, people in masks, empty grocery store shelves, that kinds of thing that kind of thing because it really stresses people out and makes them turn away. People are, I think are really looking for a message of hope and nonprofits are in a great position to actually deliver that message to them. All right, so now we're gonna talk through the logistics, um, which is why everybody's probably here, the logistics of moving your spring fundraiser online. Um, now I've tried to provide some examples of a lot of common spring fundraisers in this section. Again, I can't, possibly cover every possible scenario, but um, hopefully you can take the information that's in this section of the presentation and apply it to your fundraiser, even if it's not the exact same fundraiser or situation. Okay, so regardless of what you're doing, uh, the first step to moving your fundraiser online is obviously notifying everyone that's involved, from your sponsors, to your staff, to your volunteers, to your venue, if you were having an in-person event. Um, even at this point, if you're just uh, sorry postponing things because you wanna see how things will play out, because who knows, if you have an early June event, we may be in a better place at that point, um, just have a, a go or no go date where you make a final decision about your spring event and you announce it. So all of these people are not left in limbo and you don't have to scramble last minute. So just say, hey, we don't have an answer right now. We're waiting to see how things plan out, but we will have a final announcement for you at this date. Um, it's also helpful if you're waiting and seeing to plan out or to lay out plan A and plan B so that people know what to expect and what the different variables are, what the different options are, um, and explain what, if anything, you need from your team, from donors, from sponsors, from volunteers, etc. So then, especially if you've decided to move your event online only, you'll need to start adjusting course. So first, think about your event stru structure and strategy. Is there a value in keeping the structure of your event as it currently exists? Can you make your event remote or do you just need to completely retool it? Um, there are plenty of really cute, clever ways you can spin what was supposed to be an in-person event into a digital event. Um, for instance, a walkathon could be completely digital with people com completing their pledged distance on their own time at their own pace. Um, something that marathons kind of do anyway is they sometimes offer a pajama rate so that people can buy a discounted ticket and they can raise money for their cause remotely. Um, that's something that you could consider if you're selling tickets to a, a 5K or an event like that. Um, finding ways to adjust that are simple and easy and really just about messaging um, as opposed to having to pull a, a new fundraiser out of thin air and get it off the ground are gonna be a much better use of your resources if it's at all a possibility for the nature of your event. 
Um, if you're using Mighty Cause for your event, um, and I really don't want to spend a ton of time trying to sell you on the product during this webinar, we really just want you to take tools away from the webinar that you can use to adjust course for your spring fundraiser. Um, but if you're using Mighty Cause for your event, the good news is that it's already optimized for online fundraising. That is the default on Mighty Cause, as well as other platforms. So people can donate and participate remotely, and it's mobile responsive so that people can participate from their smartphones if they need to. Um, you can manage ticket sales and registration through our event by bright reg integration if you're using us and if you already have an event or a team set up just eliminate the in-person component and move it online and you can email participants through the participants tool on events um, so on our platform at least this should be a relatively easy and painless process since mighty cause is built for online fundraising it really shouldn't be too much of a lift to just move it online you're basically just dealing with the in-person component the online portion of your event it can basically just continue as is with some announcements to the participants and maybe just adding some more information to your about section. Um, so that's the good news is that a lot of the tools we're using, even for in-person events, if you're using Mighty Cause or if you're using another platform, a lot of them are just already set up so that it, online fundraising is the default and the rest is extra. So you just wanna focus on the online portion and get rid of the in-person portion if that's what you're planning on doing. So I wanted to actually walk through an example of how to make this happen. So I have this fictional doggy dash that I had planned for the spring. We were planning on a 5K with dogs where people were running with their dogs and we've already got sponsors involved. We've promised them booth space and goodie bag promotion, meaning that their flyers are in the goodie bag and a few are providing things like pens and styluses and magnets and stuff. Um, we sold our tickets through Eventbrite and we even have a matching grant that's available to double what people raised for our charity. We've got runners signed up, tickets are sold, fundraising has been underway for a while, so what on earth are we going to do now with this fictional Ducky Dash? Well, first, our event is in April, and there's no way anyone can say that life will be back to normal and coronavirus will be slayed by then. So we decided to fully cancel the in-person event and move it to being an online-only event. Um, we contacted some key people to let them know. Um, first, we talked to our sponsors. Um, these are people who were counting on booth space and promotion. So we're going to let them know that we're still including them in promotions for the event. We'll promote them on social media and we'll also make sure to include them in our next in-person event to make sure that they get the maximum benefit from their involvement. Um, for ticket holders, we're still holding the online event, but we're keeping ticket refunds as an absolute last resort. We're hoping that people will still participate digitally, but those for those who were set on the 5K, it was really important to them to show up in person and, and run with their dog. We're going to offer to roll their tickets, their ticket purchase into the next 5K or event, or offer tax receipts for the price of the ticket so they can be considered donations. Um, we'll give refunds if people really, really want them, but we're not advertising that. Uh, we need the cash flow right now and the event is still technically happening. And we're gonna do that on a case by case basis. If someone contacts us and they really, really want a refund, we'll consider it then. But this is how we're, we're portraying it to people who um, are participating in the event is we're still having the online event. Um, you can, there are some options to roll your ticket purchase into next the next event or next year's 5K um, or turn it into a charitable donation with a tax receipt. Um, and we're only considering refunds on a case by case basis. And then we also need to contact the venue. We have permits, we have, uh, a, we have a venue for this event and we want to let them know as soon as possible we want to see if we can get a refund or potentially roll our deposit that we paid on this venue into next year's event we're planning on using them we're securing future business with them and we're going to see if we can roll the deposit into next year's deposit um, just to maintain good relations with that venue and also see what we can do to sort of save money in the long run so here's how we're gonna message this to participants. Um, we're basically saying, we're still in if you are. Uh, we're asking them to keep doing what they're doing, keep raising money, and, keep, and give them the opportunity to compete in the 5K on their own time, on their own schedule, at their own pace, 
um, whether that's in their neighborhood, taking a walk or on their treadmill or just in spirit, they don't necessarily have to go anywhere and walk. Um, we're going to get a little bit cute and spend this as an opportunity and uh, to get out and get some fresh air and exercise while everybody's working remotely um, and giving them a goal to motivate them to do so. So we want them to complete the 5K, they can do it in fits and spurs and as it suits them. Um, we're emphasizing that their support is vital to our nonprofit during this time, just to drive home the fact that we're still counting on them showing up for us, even if it's just digitally, um, and that this was about more than just running. This was about supporting a nonprofit that's serving their community. And to help build camaraderie and fun online, we're also going to ask that people share photos of themselves working on their 5K goal with their dogs using the hashtag that we created, hashtag virtual doggy dash. And we're going to like and share and comment and interact with these people on social media, which also has a benefit because they're helping us generate content for our social media accounts. Um, so this is a great way that we can get people involved. We can get them building camaraderie and making friends with each other um, and having fun um, and still participating without actually having that in-person component. So to make sure that everybody knows about the shift to a virtual 5K, um, and again, this is not unprecedented for an event like this to be virtual, so this is not a completely outside of the box thing. These do exist. Um, here's what we're gonna do to communicate that to everybody who's involved. Um, we're gonna update the About section on our event page on Mighty Cause, so it's clear that the in-person 5K has been canceled and we're moving operations online. So the 5K itself still exists, the doggy dash, still exists, but we're moving it online. Um, and we're sending out emails through the participants dashboard and also sending out a blast to all the participants and people who have tickets using our email marketing program. Um, we're posting an update on social media and reinforcing that by sharing updates of people walking with their dogs for the virtual doggy dash um, they're participating in the event and helping us spread the word. And then finally, we've already got our goodie bags assembled, so we're just gonna offer to send them by mail. We have people's addresses, so we're just gonna get them the swag that they want and uh, get our sponsors the exposure that they were looking for by mailing them the, um, the goodie bags. All right, so uh, some tips for canceling or postponing your event. Um, number one, and this is really important, do not offer panic refunds for tickets. Um, many ticket holders have already spent this money and they're not gonna harass a nonprofit for a refund. Um, you may wanna offer to send tax receipts to them um, so that they can write their ticket purchase off as a donation. Um, and if it's at all possible for you, you should try to roll your event into being online only as with the example I just gave of the virtual doggy dash so that you don't even have to really offer refunds. Um, get creative, see how people can participate remotely so that you at your nonprofit don't have to take the financial hit of offering refunds and can still see the fundraising benefit. Um, one thing I did want to chat about is that some nonprofits, especially food pantries, hunger organizations, senior organizations, health orgs, and so on, that are really just in the thick of it right now in communities and don't really have the space to think about a walkathon or other event, and that's also 100% okay. It's fine to cancel because you just don't have the resources to focus on this right now and move on to other strategies, which we're going to talk about in the second half of this webinar. It's also really important to remember that you do not need to apologize. You did not create the coronavirus pandemic. This was fully out of your hands. Um, sometimes with donors, we can sort of default to being apologetic and subservient and doing whatever it takes to make them happy. And I'm certainly not recommending that you need to be combative here, but you do not need to apologize. You're protecting public health by canceling the in-person component of your event. Um, and you just need to keep your donors and supporters informed and let them know the facts. Um, I mention it because when we approach something with an I'm sorry mindset, we're setting it up so that people react to us expecting some kinds of some kind of amends because we're saying that we're at fault, but you're really not at fault for having to cancel your event because there was a national emergency. Um, so it's really truly not necessary to come at this from a perspective of I'm sorry. Um, and to that end, you really just want to 
to emphasize that you're not just canceling or postponing events because you felt like it, you're doing it for the good of the community and at the recommendations of experts in public health, and in some cases under government mandate. You don't have a choice. Um, I know my state is now limiting, uh, I'm in Virginia, our state is not allowing any gatherings of 50 or more people. A lot of states are doing the same thing. There's nothing you can do to get around that. You're doing it for public health. Um, and if your, your state has a shelter in place or stay at home order in effect, um, this is all just done to protect the most vulnerable people in your community. Um, and you'll wanna use this discussion to segue into how people can support your nonprofit during this time, because you, you, will, you will be talking to your supporters and people wanna know what they can do. They wanna know how they can help you. Um, so I wanted to take a moment and talk specifically about giving events. Um, I know we probably have some people on this webinar who are planning to participate in a spring giving event on Mighty Cause or on another platform. And I know that there's a little bit of anxiety around this issue because I manage some spring events um, and I'm hearing rumblings about some anxiety about whether it's okay to participate or how to participate, um, especially if there was an in-person uh, component to your campaign. So I wanted to make sure that we address this issue if you're not participating in a giving event um, on Mighty Cause or another platform. This may be a great time for a bathroom break, um, but I just wanted to make sure that we address this specific concern. Um, the great thing about giving events is that these are designed to be online events and they encourage online giving. So really, I just want to make sure that everybody who's participating in a giving event knows that you do not need an in-person event, even if that's what you have always done for this particular giving event. So uh, please feel free to apply the strategies we just just went over if you're canceling an in-person event so that you can refocus on online giving. Um, you can also rethink your campaign a bit and if your needs have changed, especially in the wake of coronavirus, um, and especially if your org is one that's really stepping up to help your community right now, um, you can sort of retool your campaign so it focuses specifically on that, that may be a stronger campaign message. Um, and it, I know that there's always a contingent of donors who want to give cash and check donations. Um, and now is really the time to push them to give online instead. Um, remind them that they can also do it from their smartphones if they insist they are no good at computers. They may have a smartphone that they can use to make a donation. And if they absolutely insist on cash or check, um, just have them mail it in so that you don't need to have a drop-off location um, during your event. That's something that we hear a lot at Mighty Cause that people like to be able to um, be present to accept cash and checks. Um, if you can get those through other means, we definitely recommend that. Or if you can use that as an opportunity to push people to give online, um, that overall helps you during the event because you're sending traffic to your page and you're getting those online donations. Um, one concern I'm hearing is that nonprofits are shifting gears to respond to the coronavirus and the needs of the community that they operate in, and there's just not enough manpower or woman power to participate in an event. Um, well, we're going to talk about this more soon, but this is the perfect opportunity to onboard some volunteers who can help you out. Um, there are a lot of skilled knowledge workers and marketers and fundraisers with extra time on their hands who would love to help you out, so don't think that you have to handle it all on your own. Um, you can absolutely enlist volunteers to help you with running a giving event campaign. So just as a bit of housekeeping, you'll want to add information about any changes to live events to your organization's profile and about section just to make sure that people know what's up. And this is another strategy we'll get into, but peer-to-peer -peer fundraising can be your savior here if you really just don't have the resources to focus on a giving event campaign because you still raise money through peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers and all you have to do is facilitate and ask people to do it for you. Um, so if your event is on Mighty Cause, this is part of the giving event game anyway. A lot of giving events have specific leaderboards for peer-to-peer -peer fundraising and specific prizes. And at Mighty Cause, this is something we talk about in our trainings for uh, giving events is peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. So this is a great opportunity to really figure out how to make that work for you. 
you. Um, peer to peer is really easy for people to do remotely. They don't have to go anywhere or meet with anybody. Um, and it's also a really great time to rope in your board. Um, they have uh, fundraising as one of their responsibilities uh, as members of the board of directors. So don't be afraid to ask your board. Um, you can also ask volunteers, any businesses that you partner with, um, individual supporters on social media and so on. Um, so don't be afraid to ask for help with peer-to-peer -peer fundraising if the option is either don't participate in the giving event and miss out on prizes and additional exposure, or just have people do peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers for you. Peer-to-peer -peer is obviously the, the better answer there. Um, and finally, if you're really, really stuck and you have concerns about your nonprofit's ability to participate, please contact your giving event host and they can chat with you and see if there's a way that you guys can make it work or if you decide to uh, remove you from the event. But we definitely want to make it clear that you should only consider being removed from the event as a last resort. There's lots of other options here. And if you are removed from a giving event, you're going to miss out on the exposure of the event and probably new donors because that's one of the uh, big things that happens during giving events is you pick up some new don donors who were drawn in by the event itself. Um, so if you don't have to drop out, please don't. And hopefully that these hopefully these suggestions can give you some ideas for how you can participate if you're just a little bit thin on human resources right now. All right, so lastly, uh, spring is often gala season. So I wanted to take some time to talk about adjusting a spring gala in the current situation. Um, so if you were planning a silent auction, which is a frequent feature of galas, that can be moved online. Um, Facebook Live is a tool that you could use for that. And there's a lot of auction tools, on online auction tools that you can use that are available. Um, you can film any speeches that would have been given at the gala and send them to people who have tickets. Um, and speaking of tickets, you could get creative here um, and enter them into a raffle for a special prize or benefit or offer to roll a percentage of the ticket price into next year's event to make it more attractive for people to not ask for refunds on their tickets. Um, and you can also just try the honest route and let them know that funding is necessary right now um, and the tickets that were sold will be used to help fund your cause and offer to give them tax receipts for the tickets so they can be considered uh, deductible donations and they can write them off on their taxes. Um, so basically, just like with uh, 5Ks and charity walks and so on, um, you don't want to rush to refund tickets. You want to try and try to find something creative that you can offer instead um, and also just drive home that this is necessary funding for your nonprofit and uh, you don't want to offer refunds if you don't have to. A lot of people who tend to uh, you know come to these galas are big supporters of your organization and they'll be willing to to work with you or just take it as a bonus that you know they got entered into a raffle and won a little prize so instead of just calling it a loss and fully canceling the gala, you could experiment and see it as an opportunity to try something new, like a peer-to-peer -peer uh, challenge for your board of directors or something along those lines. Um, something that you could also try is to move it to a virtual gala. Um, Zoom or another video conferencing tool could help you pull this off. Um, you can make speeches remotely. If you had any performances or special guests planned, you can have them join remotely as well. And something that could be really fun is if you were working with a caterer or a local restaurant that is normally involved in your gala, have them share some of the recipes um, for the food that would have been served at the gala or for restaurants, see if people can purchase meal kits and curbside pickups so they can still enjoy the nice sit down dinner as part of the virtual gala. Um, but there are still ways you can get creative and have a virtual gala. You don't necessarily have to across the board cancel it just because of coronavirus. It's an opportunity to get creative and find new ways to engage with your donors. All right, so I wanted to shift gears and move into some broader fundraising strategies that can help you get through this situation. Um, before we really dig into this, there's some important, important things to remember. Um, those of us who were doing nonprofit work for a while can have a little bit of a knee-jerk reaction to the notion of a recession and clearly remember the times of austerity and uncertainty in 2008 and beyond um, until the economy recovered. But I want to make it clear that there's currently no evidence that this is impacting charitable giving. Um, this is new. We haven't really seen the effects. Um, and this 
situation is very different than what happened in 2008. So it's hard for us to accurately apply things that happened during that recession to what could be happening shortly. Um, and the good news is that the government is currently talking about a stimulus package that will address individuals. They're, they haven't passed anything yet, but it will help individuals, small businesses, and nonprofits. Um, they're still talking over the finer points of what that will include. Um, but in the meantime, some states have already rolled out programs to help small businesses and nonprofits. Um, so make sure you know what your state is offering. Um, for instance, in Virginia, where I am right now, um, low interest disaster loans are being offered to small businesses and nonprofits. So find that information. It's usually on your local state government website. Um, and just make sure that you know what's available in case you do need to apply for a loan or a grant or something that your state is offering. Um, and one key way that this is different in 2008 is that a lot of people are simply switching to telework instead of losing their jobs. Um, obviously, unfortunately, there are some people who are losing their jobs. A lot of people in the service industry are impacted, um, but a lot of white collar jobs um, are still they still exist they're just moving to remote work so the job market is in a very very different place than it was more than a decade ago and yeah again there's some job losses but it looks like the job market is mostly just shifting um, especially among knowledge workers um, so we don't really know what the long-term impacts are um, but places are still keeping employees they're still hiring employees lots of companies especially tech companies are remote only now um, so it doesn't look like 2008 at this point. Um, and finally, it bears repeating that people are actively looking for ways to help. So I'm personally quite hopeful that the nonprofit sector um, will just need to adjust for a bit, but come out of this on the other side, strong and still helping in communities. Um, so first off, when it comes to fundraising, please stay in touch with your supporters. Don't let communication lapse because you're busy doing field work or just don't really know what to say to them during this period. Um, send them emails, post on social media, and get creative. Um, for instance, I saw today that a local animal shelter near me um, had administrative employees working from home, but they're doing um, a live story time on social media, which is really fun, uh, reading children's books with pets and foster animals, um, in the background that just reinforces their mission and it's really cool to see how creative nonprofits can get during this time. Uh, necessity is the mother of invention and we're really seeing some cool stuff happen on social media. Um, so think outside the box, see what other nonprofits are doing um, and use those communications to reinforce how people can help you. Um, that means donations, especially recurring ones, uh, volunteering remotely, peer-to-peer -peer fundraising and so on. Um, and like the story time idea, it's important to stay hopeful. Um, people are looking for positive, hopeful um, content that's a little bit distracting from the news cycle. Um, so see how you can provide that in a way that stays true to what your nonprofit does and what your mission is. Um, lots of people are bored at home and refreshing social media frequently. Um, so you may as well be in people's feeds when they're checking out Facebook for the millionth time that day. Um, okay, so I mentioned this before, but now is really the time to loop in volunteers, especially if you're low on human resources right now. Um, there are lots of people who are at home and looking to stay engaged and productive, and they have lots of free time now. Um, so think through some jobs for volunteers that you think would be legitimately helpful to your organization. Um, things like email marketing, posting on social media, help with administrative tasks. These are all things that you can potentially farm out to volunteers. And again, there are lots of very skilled people who are just kind of sitting at home looking for ways to help. So a lot of times we can think of volunteers in terms of things like physical labor, washing dishes, sorting through in-kind donations in your lobby, um, greeting visitors, answering phones. But by doing that, you're missing out on a lot of really skilled people who could be helping you out. Um, also look for fundraising help, um, whether that's through peer-to-peer -peer or helping with your campaign or general fundraising tasks. Um, these are things that can be done remotely and will be a huge help to you. Um, sometimes we're a little bit nervous about letting volunteers into that area of our nonprofit, but it's they can be hugely helpful. There are a lot of people with amazing skills who are happy to help with you, help you during this period. And then stuff like calling and thanking donors can be really helpful at keeping your people engaged, and it's easy for people to just do remotely from home. You send them a list, they thank people, and you provide a little script for them.
again, think through what would be most helpful, what your nonprofit's needs are right now. Um, there are a ton of people who work in finance, who work in marketing, they work in social media or technology, um, who could really be a huge boon to you right now. And they're looking for ways to get involved. I'm not just making this up. People are looking for ways to help. Um, so put together some uh, job descriptions and post them. Um, if you're on Mighty Cause and you have an advanced subscription, you can use the volunteers tool for that. But really something as simple as a Google Sheet is good enough. Um, you just want to ask for what you're looking for, what the task involves, what kind of experience you're looking for, um, and the numbers of out the number of hours and time commitment that you're looking for um, for these positions. And then just spread the word on social media through email on your website, your blog, and so on. Um, and have a dedicated email address for anyone applying to. Um, volunteer for you and make sure that somebody is is responding to these people because it's not a great experience when somebody reaches out to see how they can help and they don't get a response. Uh, so just make sure you have somebody monitoring that. Um, so an example of where uh, some nonprofits are really just knocking it out of the park in this crisis is animal shelters and rescues. Um, the screenshot here is from a story in the Washington Post about how people are turning to animal adoption and becoming foster volunteers um, in much larger numbers. And this is really because many animal shelters have taken pains to invite people to become foster parents to animals at their shelter to help out an animal and adopt an animal at their shelter so that they have a furry companion while they're practicing social distancing, working from home, and maybe cut off from their normal support system. It's I've also seen it spun as a great way to keep your kids occupied when they're home from school. Um, a lot of shelters have actually seen adoptions go up um, since they since people are finally at home and they finally have the time to spend with a new dog or a new cat that they've always wanted but thought they were really too busy for and didn't have time for, um, at least to get them acclimated to their new home. Um, shelters have been adapting by asking for people to make appointments to meet animals so they can still send animals home without endangering the public and they're really just hitting this sweet spot of hope, hopefulness that really hammers home what they do not just for animals but for people and for the public um, and that's really resonating with people right now um, so obviously this doesn't work for every nonprofit and uh, shelters do have their challenges some people are surrendering their animals since there was the dog in Hong Kong that had a uh, coronavirus um, so some it, some shelters are seeing different effects but this is a really great example of how you can use this situation to deliver a message of hope and also hammer home what you do in your community. So back to fundraising strategies, this is a great time to focus on getting recurring donations. Um, those monthly donations are predictable income that can help keep you afloat. Um, and you can spin it to people that way. This is an unpredictable time and a small monthly donation will really help get your nonprofit through this period and help you continue helping your community. Um, and approaching this as giving an, in a smaller monthly amount can help people feel that it's a lot more approachable, um, especially in an era of financial uncertainty. People may not feel like they have the space to give a lot of money, but most people have the space to give $20 every month or so. Um, so if you're using Mighty Cause, like pretty much every other platform out there, we're able to process recurring donations for you. And we actually allow the donor to update and edit their donation at any time through their account. So the donor has full control over their donation. Um, so this is a great way to get more recurring donations and push for ongoing support of your nonprofit. Um, and I also wanted to mention that donors can set up a uh, recurring donation through our widget now. Um, so if you're using a PayPal button or something else on your website, um, just try installing our widget. It makes it even easier for people to set up a recurring donation for your organization. And it's a really easy thing to embed. It's not any more complicated than a PayPal button. Um, and that's a really great way to capture those donations that will help carry you through this period. Okay, so finally, peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. Um, it's an easy way to help your nonprofit. I've talked about it a lot, and it really is a great way to engage donors and get income during this period of uncertainty. Um, it can be done remotely, and it's the kind of thing that a lot of people are looking to do now anyway. Um, on Mighty Cause, we actually just added a feature a few months ago called Fundraiser Templates um, that lets you create a peer-to-peer -peer template that pre-fills certain parts of the page so that your 
your fundraisers can get published and start raising money even more easily. It just helps facilitate it for them in an even smoother and more seamless process. Um, this is a really great option if you have limited resources right now and you're just really struggling to focus on fundraising. Again, all you have to do here is facilitate. You just have to ask. Um, and asking on social media is helpful, sending out an email. Um, and one thing that I recommend um, is doing some targeted communications with people who may have fundraised for you in the past. So people who've already created fundraisers for you, um, they are probably more than willing to do it again if you just ask them um, and maybe send them a quick email depending on how big your list is. All right, so we're in the home stretch and I just wanted to shift gears again and talk for a minute about remote work. Um, since I know a lot of um, nonprofit staff are working at home for the first time now, and this may be totally new to your organization. Um, so working remotely is something that I personally have a lot of experience with because Mighty Cause lets me work from home regularly and we're set up for remote employees. So I just wanted to take a minute and talk about remote work for a bit. So remote work does have some key differences, but managing remote employees is not that different from being a good manager in an office environment. Um, first, you'll need to communicate, um, probably much more frequently and intentionally as you shift to working remotely for the first time. Um, and you'll wanna check in and see how people are doing, if there are any barriers to working from home, and just check in with them because while working from home can seem like a massive privilege, and it is, um, it can also be really isolating and harder to stay on task. Um, and you're routine is kind of thrown into the air and you have to self-manage a lot more than you're usually used to in an office environment. Um, so when you're managing a remote team, it's really helpful to focus on goals rather than hours worked. Um, people work at different paces and making sure the work is done when it needs to be done by is the best metric uh, by which to determine whether people are working well, um, not how many hours they sat at their desk or were available in a chat program like Slack. Um, it can also be really hard, um, especially if you're new to remote work, to avoid the temptation to micromanage. Um, I'm a huge fan of Ask a Manager. I highly recommend that you you check that blog out um, and you'll see a lot of horror stories there about bosses who are micromanaging their remote employees um, by requesting that employees leave their webcam on all day so they can watch them work at their desks. Bosses who require a minute by minute report of what they did throughout the day, um, trying to catch them slacking off. Um, and I even read yesterday that a company was literally driving by an employee's house to make sure that they were isolating and not outside doing yard work or whatever. So basically just try really hard not to be that manager. Try to trust your team, um, check in with them and monitor their progress on tasks without trying to manage them, um, just sitting at their desks all day long, just because. Um, and on that note, this is a time to be flexible. Um, lots of people have kids that are home from school. Um, in my state, they just closed schools down for the remainder of the school year. Um, so you do need to have some flexibility for that. Um, some people might have family members that they're helping to take care of um, or doing tasks for. Um, and some people may just be struggling with anxiety and isolation. So now is the time to be a benevolent overseer rather than an unrelenting task manager. Um, to that end, you'll want to focus on setting expectations. Um, you should hopefully at this point have an org-wide policy about remote work, who, if anyone, is expected to come in, and so on. Um, you'll want to develop some guidelines for when remote employees are expected to be online, how they'll signal to others that they're available. Um, using a chat program like Slack is really great for this. If you're on Slack, then you're available. And where this is helpful is in people panicking because they don't know how to contact someone um, or they need to contact them right now and they need a question answered. Um, so they resort to calling and texting them, which can make working remotely really difficult. Um, and managers need to work individually with employees to take into account their needs, their availability, and their personal situation um, and set expectations for their work while they are remote. So if you are working remotely for the first time as an employee, as a manager, just as a person, um, here are some recommendations for doing that successfully. Um, first, you'll hear this everywhere in every listicle that talks about remote work, but develop a daily routine. All of those external cues like coworkers who are grabbing lunch or packing their things up at the end of the day, those are gone. So it's really just on you to make sure that you're staying on task and doing what you need to do. Um, 
And it's also easy to fall into feeling like you've lost grip on time and your schedule. So having a daily routine um, is really helpful in not having that feeling. Um, having a work area that is as separate as possible from the rest of your home as possible. Um, even if that's a kitchen table, working from the couch is bad for ergonomics. Having a specific spot that you can go to just makes you feel more on for your workday and makes it easier to shut off work when you're physically removing yourself from that dedicated workspace. Um, get dressed, obviously. You don't need to wear slacks and a blazer, but getting dressed is important for mental health and getting your mind into a work mode. Um, I'm really bad at this, but take a lunch break. Actually walk away from your desk or your workspace and eat lunch. Get up and stretch, walk around, go outside with your dog if you have one. Um, even if you have to set reminders for yourself or build this into your calendar. Um, and finally, set healthy boundaries. Unplug from your work apps at the end of the day. Resist the temptation to work late or check in early or check in during your off hours if it's not necessary for you to do so. Do so. And remember that working from home does not mean that you are on call 24 hours a day. And finally, this is the last slide. Um, I wanted to chat about self-care because it's important um, anytime, and it's especially important during a pandemic situation. Um, and obviously caring for yourself is important to being effective at your job. Um, so schedule some time to unplug totally from the news and from work. Um, you can freeze apps on your phone to stop them from delivering notifications, um, or just put your phone in another room. Um, if you have a Mac, you can mute your notifications so that you can just sort of hunker down and get work done. Um, but just make a, an effort to unplug once in a while. Um, stay in touch with your friends and family with digital tools like FaceTime, Skype, Google Hangouts, and so on. Um, and I really can't emphasize this enough. Set some boundaries when it comes to work. Nonprofit employees are really bad at this. I've been there myself. Um, nonprofit employees tend to be very reactionary, but that's a bad way to work for your mental health. So before you jump to respond to that off hours, non-emergency email or text message, um, ask yourself if you really need to or if it can wait until normal business hours. Um, you can screen your calls, let them go to voicemail during off hours and only respond if it's an emergency. Um, and you can even set up a Google voice number so that people don't actually call your real phone. Um, talk to your colleagues, let them know what you need from them, whether it's only to reach out after out, never only reach out after hours with emergencies or not to contact your cell phone. Um, and most importantly, um, when you're stressed, remind yourself of how valuable your work is, how important your mission is to your community, especially as your community, community is struggling. Um, you're one of the helpers, the work you do is important, um, and that's just really important to remember, especially when things are stressful and feel uncertain. Everything that you're doing now is going to help your community and it's vitally important. All right, so um, I just wanted to open the floor up to questions now. So if you have a question for me, uh, just type that into the questions box of your GoToWebinar panel, and we'll try to get to everyone's questions. All right, give me just a second. All right, so um, this is always a question. I'm sorry, I always tend to answer this at the beginning, but we were recording this. Um, so you will get a video of this webinar if you wanted to share it with your um, you, your staff, if you wanted to share it with volunteers, if you wanted to just have somebody else watch or you just wanted to keep it for yourself, we will circulate a video of this webinar. Um, so somebody thinks that I downplayed the um, unemployment filings. I mean, this is true. It's not quite what we saw in 2008. So I was trying to draw a comparison to the Great Recession. Obviously, things are bad and uncertain now. Um, people are feeling the strain. Um, but I wasn't trying to downplay it. I was just trying to deliver a mes message of hope, which is that we don't really know that this is going to have long-term ramifications for the nonprofit sector. And a lot of people um, are keeping their jobs. They're still working. They're still bringing in money. And they're still making charitable donations. And this is very different from what we saw in 2008. So it's very easy to apply the logic of this is what happened uh, over a decade ago to what's happening now, um, but that's really sort of jumping the gun and making assumptions about the long-term impact of this situation. So I, I do apologize if you felt that way. Um, I am very 
grateful and thankful to still have a job myself, and I certainly did not want to imply that um, only white collar workers are important, but a lot of people are able to work remotely, whereas uh, you know, over a decade ago, if you couldn't come to the office, the world was just really not set up for you to work remotely. So a lot of people are just able to adjust how they work as opposed to losing their jobs. But certainly lots of people are in bad situations. Um, and I'm really happy to see that people have risen to the occasion and started collection funds for those people. Um, we have a few going on Mighty Cause right now. So um, it's really helpful to see that people are, are already trying to assist people and that we've already got an economic stimulus package that's in the works. Um, so yeah, the slides will be available as well as the recording just to answer that question as well. Um, <clears throat> let's see, um, does Mighty Cause have a way to hold a silent auction or is there a way to link to another platform? Um, so actually that's a good question. Um, auctions and raffles and things of those nature are one of the things that we cannot do at Mighty Cause. And that's because uh, donations are processed through the Mighty Cause Charitable Foundation and everybody gets a tax receipt saying that no goods or services were exchanged um, for the donation. So we don't allow auctions, but there are um, plenty of tools that do allow that. BidPal is one of them, I believe. Um, but if you just do a Google search for um, silent auction tools or silent auction programs, you'll, sh you'll be sure to find some. There's a lot of uh, review programs out there as well um, where you can look at other reviews of nonprofits who use those platforms for silent auctions. Um, but that is actually one of the things that not Mighty Cause specifically cannot do because of the involvement of our charitable foundation. Let's see. Um, have you seen any ways nonprofits have brought galas or luncheons online? Um, at this point, I haven't seen it. I think we're a little bit early in the season for galas and luncheons, um, but I think pretty much everything that you can do um, is you can do virtually. So um, you have enough time to adjust course. Um, I think having a virtual gala where you have everybody log into a Zoom meeting um, and you give speeches remotely, I think that could be really fun um, if you end up doing that if you end up piloting that please let me know and I'm definitely going to keep my eyes open for that sort of thing I think we're just a little bit early because we're not quite in April yet um, but I'm hoping we'll see more of that um, definitely nonprofits are getting really creative in how they adjust to the situation so no I haven't personally seen any on the mighty cause platform yet but I hope that some of you who have a gala or a luncheon plan um, will try it out and see how it works and 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 let me see the results because I think it could be a really great way to engage that audience without having to fully cancel the the, the um, gala. Um, so somebody wants to know if I have any other virtual fundraising ideas besides fun runs. Yeah, so we actually have a lot of, uh, there's, it's almost like so limitless that it was hard for me to put down like what we can do. I think a lot of people in the spring, at least from what I've seen working for Mighty Cause, tend to do walkathons, um, fun runs. Um, but we also see a lot of things in the athon genre of fundraising that are really great for remote work or to be done remotely. Um, a lot of schools have readathons. Um, that could be something that's really fun. People are indoors. They're um, not going anywhere, so a readathon is a really fun idea. Um, and you could always just have a spring campaign, you know, uh, you know, push your message out there in the way that you normally would, like at end of year. Um, you know, if you're fundraising for something in particular, um, fun, you know, put a campaign together around that. Um, but readathons, artathons, um, things that people can do at home or at their own on their own time are really easy to bring online rather than having an in-person event. Um, we do have a whole category of our blog dedicated to fundraising ideas. So if you would like to see some more fundraising ideas, most of those articles were written by me. Um, you can go to blog.mightycause.com um, or just go to our website, mightycause.com and just click on the link in the navigation bar for our blog. Um, but you can actually just find a whole category of fundraising ideas. We have one on spring fundraising ideas. We have general nonprofit fundraising ideas. There's some for churches. There's some for schools. So there's a lot of content there if you're just sort of looking for inspiration um, that you can find in the fundraising category section of our blog. Um, so somebody was curious as to whether everyone is rescheduling events for the fall versus late spring, early summer. 
I actually don't know the question, the answer to that. Um, you may want to just see if you have any colleagues out there and see what they're doing. Um, you know, certain events could certainly just be moved to the fall. The problem is with that is that we don't really know what the situation will be like in the fall. Will it be better? Will life be back to normal? Will we have another round of this? Um, so I think people are kind of just defaulting to um, postponing or canceling their events or finding some way to move them online so that they don't have to go back to the drawing board again in the fall if something happens and we're not quite back to normal in our country. Um, so I don't have any statistics or data there, um, but I think most people are just kind of looking and into the immediate future and seeing how they can get revenue coming in in the next few months, get through this rough, rocky period, um, and then go from there. So I think, um, you know, I'm not really sure what other nonprofits are doing. It may vary based on states and how hard they're hit. So um, it's a really great opportunity if you're part of any like Facebook groups um, to reach out to your colleagues and see what they're doing. Because you certainly could just po postpone something until the fall. The, the tricky thing is that that puts the revenue off into the fall um, and you wanna make sure that you're keeping funding coming in now. And we also don't know what the situation will be like in the fall. So um, I think that's mostly what I'm hearing from nonprofits is that they're just trying to move everything online as best they can. Um, let's see, uh, for moving a spring gala online, how would you manage the pickup of silent auction items when we have been instructed to keep distance from people and our office is not open to the public? That's a really good question. Um, I guess it depends on the state. Um, in a lot of places, if you're able to uh, meet with them and keep your distance, you could organize a drop off depending on how many, um, how many items you have to pick up and how cumbersome those items are. You could also um, arrange for a volunteer to deliver the items, um, if possible, to people's homes if people are comfortable with that. Um, you could choose a temporary location and just have one employee working there or one volunteer working there and have people distanced or allow one person in at a time to keep distance. Um, and you could also just tell them that the pickup is going to be uh, to be announced, that they will get their item they will get the thing they were promised. If it's a time sensitive thing like a gift certificate or something like that where they want to redeem it immediately, um, you can maybe see if they can have it delivered to them. But there's some solutions around that. I think looking to the retail industry, um, especially small businesses that are considered non-essential, a lot of them are moving to allowing a small number of people into a facility at the same time and keeping the six foot distance. I've seen stores using markers on the floor to keep people apart from each other. Um, but that could be one way that you could manage that. Um, and you could also just say, hey, we're still figuring this out. You'll get your item. Um, we just need to figure out when and how. And you could also just contact the person who, who won that item and see what they are comfortable with. If they're fine with a volunteer uh, driving to their house and dropping it off in their mailbox or their front porch or whatever that may be. Um, but you can you can certainly manage that. Um, and that would be a great situation where a volunteer who you know maybe can spend a day or two driving the items to people's homes um, is, is, is a helpful way to um, make sure that everybody gets their items. Um, do you have any suggestions for moving raffle drawings online? We have around 50 products to raffle, that's awesome, um, and sell raffle tickets at the event. Is there a way to sell raffle tickets remotely? Um, I believe so. Uh, again, on Mighty Cause, we don't allow the sale of raffle tickets, um, but do some Googling. I'm sure there's something out there. There's a platform for nearly everything. Um, if I can if I can find one that is recommended, um, I will certainly pass that on in follow-up to this webinar just so you can uh, take a look at them and see if they're right for you. But I'm pretty sure that there's definitely some uh, platforms that you can find. Um, and I'll do some research myself. And if I'm able to find some, I'll follow up with that information um, as well. Um, how do we find the, the chat program Slack? Um, so Slack is what we use at Mighty Cause. Um, you just go to slack.com. They do actually have a discount available for uh, nonprofits. Um, so that's worth checking out. You can get that, uh, get that program for a much 
cheaper rate as a nonprofit. Um, but slack.com, S-L-A-C-K.com. Um, and I really love them for workflow purposes. Um, you can have different channels where you discuss things so that you can also mute channels that are not important and you don't get, you don't get bombarded with notifications from those channels. But it's just a really great way to organize your workflow and keep uh, the communication flowing between your um, your staff. So slack.com is what I recommend. Um, things like Google Chat, if you're using the Google Work Suite, can also be really helpful. They just don't have the, the organization tools that Slack does. Um, but check out Slack. They have a nonprofit discount. I don't work for Slack. Uh, we use Slack at Mighty Cause, uh, but I do highly recommend them as a program. Um, let's see, for galas and such, how do you think we can handle rights for performances or streaming storytelling tools online or storytelling videos online? I'm hearing buzz about authors not being happy about these storytelling videos and wonder about um, streaming any other types of live performances and legal ramifications later. That's a really good question. Um, definitely make sure that if you are uh, streaming something, you have the rights to do so. If you're using video conferencing and you're not you know, putting it up on YouTube, um, that you know, may be a way around that. If your gala is, for instance, through a Zoom conference, no one would really know if somebody is performing a cover of a pop song in your Zoom conference um, because it's a limited audience of people. Um, and definitely, you know, you can always email the artist or the company and see if they have, if you have rights to it. You may also just need to retool and instead of doing something um, like by Ariana Grande uh, for your performance, choose something that's in the public domain. Um, if you have any music that you wanted to have performed then uh, for story time, um, yeah, I haven't heard that yet, um, but you know, definitely checking with the authors. Usually, that's a, a good way to go. Or using using something where you have a pre-existing relationship, or you just say, "Hey, can we do this?" But in most cases, you're not trying to profit off them, so it could just be grumbling. I think uh, authors are one of the contingents of artists who are um, struggling during this period. They can't go on book tours. They can't do book signings. Um, but maybe crediting them is a great way, saying, hey, this author is fantastic. We love this book. Go show them some love on their social media page is a way to offer an olive branch. Um, but I don't think that I'm not an expert. Um, you can always check with your attorneys about this. But I think as long as you're not using their their art to make a profit of some kind. Um, I think you might be in the clear, um, but just to be on the safe side, you can always reach out to the author beforehand or stick with things that you know aren't likely to cause an issue. Um, you know, so that's that's really the easiest answer to that. But you can always check with your attorneys if you have any questions about that. Um, copyright law is not really my area of expertise, um, but I think a lot of nonprofits are doing that kind of thing with um, without getting themselves into trouble, um, because usually the author is the one that comes off um, badly during that if they they uh, you know make a big stink about it. Um, let's see. Oh, this seems fun. Um, we have a Jello wrestling event that we had to cancel. It brings a lot of money for us. Based on your experience, do you have a recommendation to do that online while keeping it fun? That's a tough one um, because Jello wrestling is something that's a little hard to do remotely. Um, you definitely don't want to have people, you know, wrestling each other uh, during this period in time. So, um, you know, that may be a tough one to move online. Um, one thing that you could do is if you have video of old Jello wrestling matches, um, you could share those with people um, and sort of use those as incentive and like, hey, this is what it's all about um, and still have the wrestlers. I assume the wrestlers are fundraising as part of the uh, the wrestling match event, um, still have them fundraising, but maybe leaning on old photos, old um, old videos and that sort of thing uh, to sort of get the idea across. But really, if, if you're using an event where the main idea is fundraising, having the people who would participate, the wrestlers who would participate, still fundraise, still get involved that way, um, and leaning on old content is a safe way to do that. Um, you know, I just, that's a little trickier because that involves some physical contact and contact and right now obviously we're recommending social distancing. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's that's a tricky one to move online, but you could still do it, just have peer-to-peer -peer fundraising be the uh, centerpiece there rather than the actual wrestling. Um, let's see. 
Um, is there any financial examples of charging from a physical event to a virtual event? Um, we made 30K with a physical event. We made 13K with only a virtual event. Um, so financial, like hard financial examples of fundraisers that have taken place on Mighty Cause, I don't have on hand right now. Um, generally, you don't, since your expenses are a little bit less with a, um, a virtual event, you would probably want to offer a discount on ticket prices. Um, and the advice there is to really not lean as much on ticket sales to drive revenue. Um, having a peer-to-peer -peer fundraising aspect where people are also raising money um, in addition to purchasing tickets is a great way to go about it, thinking of ways that you can get revenue and donations coming in that are not just based around the ticket sale um so that is it's really i don't have any hard examples of that right now unfortunately um you guys are really <laughs> asking really fantastic questions um but yeah you might make a little you're going to make less with ticket sales for a virtual event um but you want to just try to make up for that with other uh, streams of donations like peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, having some fundraising challenges in there um, just to uh, keep money flowing in um, that's not as dependent on ticket sales and purchasing a ticket to a specific event. Um, so yeah, I mean, I can certainly look into that and see if there are any examples, um, but it's... Um, it's a little trickier. You, you basically, um, most events where they, they do have like a pajama rate or something like that, they are offering a discount and it's just looking at um, ticket sales as not being the main source of revenue from that particular event and adding um, a, you know, a raffle, a silent auction, peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, whatever it may be, adding another component that kind of makes up the difference. Okay, um, this isn't really a fundraiser, but no, some nonprofits utilize teams like mission teams. How do you think that refunds should be handled with those? Um, so that's really interesting. We do have a lot of mission trip fundraisers on Mighty Cause. Um, I would really uh, check in with the people who have raised money for those trips. Um, you know, has the money been spent yet? Is it still available? Um, will there be a mission trip in the future that you can just sort of roll this fundraising into? Um, a lot of the people who donate to mission trip fundraisers are families of the people who are going on the mission trip. Um, so grandma, grandpa, aunt, Aunt Sue and Uncle Jim, those are people who are generally not going to be hard pressed for a refund um, for a mission trip fundraiser. Um, so it may just be a matter of looking at who the, the donors actually are. A lot of them are gonna be family members and family friends who are not gonna be super stressed about um, a refund. Um, but certainly, you know, looking at the future of that, that trip, is that trip still going to happen at an undetermined future date? Um, and maybe just reframing the fundraiser for the mission trip itself is, hey, we don't actually know when this is going to happen, but we have a specific plan to go to this particular place and do this thing um, as part of our, our faith mission um, and just keep fundraising under that premise that this is for a, a future mission trip. Um, and it's also going to help the church um, during this time because a lot of churches are not able to uh, have gatherings at their um, premises. So you can spin it that way and sort of make it a general fundraiser for the church and a future mission trip. So that is probably the easiest way to handle that. But there, we haven't really, we get a lot of requests for refunds at Mighty Cause, most, mostly mission trips because it's family and family friends are really not as pressed about getting, um, getting a refund for their donation to, you know, say a family member's mission trip fundraiser. So hopefully that helps. Um, but if you have a specific situation, you can always contact me and we can sort of troubleshoot that. Okay, so for online auctions and donate, and you, if you guys uh, would like to go, I know that we're up, we're past our time, uh, but I want to try to answer all of these questions um, as much as I can, uh, but this will be recorded if you have another meeting or something that you need to go to, um, but I just want to go through all of the questions because you guys are asking some amazing questions. Um, so for online auctions and donated items such as gift certificates, health clubs, et cetera, from small businesses with expiration dates, how would you suggest offering them with the uncertainty of the business? Um, that's a great question. I would maybe reach out to the um, 
the business. Um, like if you had a spa, like obviously spas are not open in a lot of places. See what they're doing because likely yours is not the only gift certificate or gift card that they had. Um, so they may be willing to extend the expiration date on those or accept them indefinitely. Um, so I would reach out to the businesses in question and see what the situation is there. Um, obviously if they're not in operation, um, you know, those can't be redeemed, um, but they are, might be flexible with gift cards um, because of the fact that a lot of them have had to close down and people are buying gift cards and gift certificates sort of um, to promise them future business and help them get through this period. So that would be my recommendation is to just reach out to the businesses um, and see what they are willing to do because a lot of times they're going to be flexible because they don't have any other option but to be flexible with accepting gift cards and gift certificates um, and just communicate that to the people during the auction. Okay, so can Mighty Cause link to the silent auction platform as a follow-up question so that we can have an online component and connect the silent auction via BidPal, for example? Because of the, we have to follow IRS regulations, we can't allow auctions, period, on Mighty Cause. There can be no goods or services exchanged for a donation on our platform. So we don't actually have a an integration with any sort of online auction platform. Um, I can always bring that back to the team and see if that's something that we could consider in the future. But at this point, um, we don't have any integration because of that tax deductibility conflict that comes into play um, with uh, auctions and raffles and things of that nature. Um, what do you see as the pros and cons of postponing a spring gala slash event to the fall? Um, yeah, I mean, there's there are some pros to it. Um, you know, that way you have a definite date in the future when you know you're having this event. Um, the big con is really that you're kind of kicking the can down the road um, and possibly upending any fall plans you had. So if you had a fall fundraiser planned, um, usually in October is when things really start to kick into gear. Um, for the fall at nonprofits, you may be sort of bumping another fundraiser for this fundraiser that may have that was supposed to happen in April or May. So it kind of just further destabilizes your fundraising calendar um, and your fundraising plan. That may be something that your nonprofit is absolutely fine with. Maybe you um, don't have things planned out a year in advance and that's 100% fine. And so that is something that you can consider. The other con and thing to think about is, are we gonna be in a better situation in the fall? And do we know that? Um, at this point, we really don't know what the fall is going to bring. Um, I'm not a public health expert, but I have seen that, um, you know, the CDC and, and experts from the World Health Organization are saying that there could be another round of this in the fall. So that is something to think about. Um, do we want to kick the road, kick the can down the road into, you know, September or October and then find ourselves in the same situation where we have to rethink an event. Um, so it's up to you and whatever works best for your nonprofit. If you feel comfortable sort of rescheduling it um, for the fall, then you know you can absolutely do that with the, the knowledge that we don't really know for sure what the fall is going to look like in terms of the virus and the precautions that we'll have to take. Um, so that is something to think about is that we just really don't know the future of what's going to happen with this and where we'll be at and whether the United States will be at full operation again. I sure hope we will, um, but it, there's just so many question marks at this point that my recommendation would be sort of to get this done, get your fundraising event done with to the extent that you can with the tools that you have now so that you have the revenue stream coming in, um, you have the donations coming in, and when we get to fall, you can go forward with another plan or another event or situate fundraising uh, effort without having to, um, you know, do something that was meant for the the spring. So staying on schedule and keeping that that fundraising revenue coming in, I think, is probably the most important thing because we just don't know what September or October is going to look like at this point. Um, 
Can we send personalized thank yous through the Mighty Cause platform with our organization's updates? Um, yeah, so you can do that. You can email donors through, I think, the supporters tool that is an advanced subscription feature. So on our starter plan, which is our free plan, um, you cannot do that. Um, and we're looking at adding some more email marketing tools into our um, fundraising suite in the future. Um, but you can do some personal emailing through Mighty Cause um, through the supporters tool, which is our CR tool. Um, so if that's something you're interested in, um, you can start a free trial of Mighty Cause Advanced and check out the tools. One of them is the supporters tool where you can actually individually contact um, donors or you can just sort of click through a list and contact certain kinds of donors. It's got a lot of really cool features um, such as um, you can filter, um, create filters so that you can easily segment certain types of supporters, donors, volunteers, fundraisers, et cetera, and actually use an email function through the platform. So um, if you are interested in that, check out uh, Mighty Cause Advanced and start your free trial. Um, and that is an option that's available to you and can make this a little bit easier if you don't have, um, have an email marketing program. Let's see, um, oh, this is an interesting one. Do you think direct mail will be affected? Um, I'm actually not sure. So the big mail centers, I probably would guess, are considered essential operations in the United States. So I'm not quite sure um, what the effect will be. Certainly a lot of marketing agencies like the direct mail companies are able to work remotely. And I think that the mailing houses that they use are considered essential. They're usually not just handling your mailers, they're usually handi handling other mail as well. Um, so as far as I know, the postal service is not going to be affected. Um, usually the marketing companies are able to work remotely with the exception of the the printers and the mail houses. And I think at least the mail houses are probably gonna be considered essential. Um, but it's if you have a company that you're using, check in with them, see what they're doing. Um, hopefully they would have reached out to you at this point to explain how their operations might be affected. Um, but that's a good question. I think as long as the mail is going um, and the company itself is able to handle things remotely, um, you'll probably be not see direct mail affected unless this con continues for a lot longer. Um, I think at the very most, you might see a delay in certain mailers going out, um, but certainly reach out to the company that you're using if you haven't gotten in touch with them yet or heard anything from them. Oh, somebody uh, has a recommendation for raffles. They recommend Silent Auction Pro. Um, so that's one to check out um, and has a personal recommendation from Lisa on the webinar if you're looking for an auction webinar, uh, an auction tool to use. Uh, let's see, I'm just scrolling through the questions. Um, what if your nonprofit's mission cannot be carried out during this time? I.e., is it a school-based program? Any thoughts on how to seem relevant when so many other missions are critical at this time? <clears throat> That's also a really fantastic question. I mean, obviously, there's going to be a spotlight on certain kinds of um, organizations during this time food pantries, health organizations, public health organizations, um, even animal shelters, um, things like that, are they're going to draw more attention, but your mission is still important. Um, and, you know, it's it can be mean shifting your focus a little bit. Um, you know, you don't want to have the impression that you don't feel that your mission is important because it is even if you're doing a school-based program or you're in education those are extremely critical right now um, you could consider if your operations have kind of shuttered working with another um, aligned organization in the area to see how you can help um, for instance when it comes to education and school-based stuff you know why not partner with a, a nonprofit that handles school lunch debt a lot of those nonprofits are really springing into action to help, um, you know, students stay fed. Food pantries sometimes have, um, you know, a program that's helping school students stay fed um, during schools being closed because unfortunately for a lot of kids, the school lunch that they get um, is the only guaranteed meal of the day that they're, you know, provided. So um, figuring out within your community, if you can form alliances, build a coalition, work with other nonprofits, um, just to, you know, get involved in your area of work, area of concern. Um, you know, your your mission is still relevant because this is temporary. Um, and, you know, we don't know how long it's going to last. 
but every nonprofit's mission is important now. Um, and for a school-based program, even if it's you know an arts program, that's still incredibly relevant. What do you what are you doing for students? Um, you may not be able to sort of use coronavirus as your hook. Uh, look at all of the great things we're doing, especially if your operations are shuttered. Um, but definitely having an appeal that says, hey, we're still we're still an organization. We're planning on helping students in the following ways and really hammering home that you're still here, you're still you're still doing what you can to help students if you're in an education program or whatever your area of concern may be. Um, staying in contact, you don't have to email them every day or as frequently or as aggressively as other organizations that are more directly affected might, but still keep fundraising um, and talk to them honestly about, you know, our services are, are shuttered at the moment but we're still doing x y and z or just offering your support to another organization in the area or partnering with another organization in the area to sort of become more relevant to what's happening um, those are all things that you can consider um oh okay i sorry if i didn't answered this during the course of the webinar, but probably should know this by now, which is not true because I didn't tell you, but what do you mean by peer-to-peer? -peer? And this is our last question, by the way. Um, so peer-to-peer -peer fundraising is a fundraising technique where you ask your supporters to fundraise on your behalf. On Mighty Cause, they get their own page with its own URL where they can sort of talk about what they're doing and why, um, and they can ask their social network to um, fundraise, to I mean, to donate to the cause. So um, this is a really effective way to get your board involved, um, having a board peer-to-peer -peer challenge. Basically, the name comes from is it's a somebody's asking their peers to donate to your cause. So you're kind of deputizing people in your community to fundraise on your behalf. Um, a great example of this is uh, Facebook fundraisers. When people start birthday fundraisers, um, that's all peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. So when I say peer-to-peer, -peer, I really mean just asking somebody outside of your nonprofit, um, at least outside of your, you know, they're representing themselves rather than representing your nonprofit to fundraise and ask their social network to support a cause that they care a lot about. Um, and this is a really great way for board members, volunteers, and even staff members to get involved just to sort of create a fundraiser page where they say, hey, this cause is really important to me. I work with them in the following way. This is why I care about them. This is my story about how I came to be involved with them. Um, and I'd like everybody to donate to them um, during this period to help them, you know, keep doing what they're doing. Um, that can be really powerful. Um, so, we do have a tool set up for that on Mighty Cause. It's very simple for them to, to create their fundraiser. The button to do that is right next to uh, the donate button. So they just need to go to your Mighty Cause profile, click fundraise, and they will be dropped into a fundraiser creation wizard. Um, but that's what that means is you're not doing the fundraising. You're kind of farming it out to um, your supporters. Um, but that's a really great way to get around things like staff shortages um, and questions about how, uh, how you're going to find the time to fundraise if you're out in your community every day um, helping during this situation. So it's basically if, if I work for a nonprofit, um, me as a, as a staff member, me, Linda, the individual saying, hey, I work for this nonprofit. We're doing this. It's really great. It's my birthday. Instead of presents, I would like for you to donate to this cause because I care so much about it. And then getting all of my family and friends to donate, um, which is a really great donor acquisition tool because what we see with peer-to-peer -peer is that for the most part, the donors to a peer-to-peer -peer campaign are new to the organization. So that's another really great thing that comes out of peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, aside from you sort of offloading the, the the work of fundraising onto someone else. Um, and a lot of these things do just pop up organically, as in with birthday fundraisers, but now is a time when it's really okay and encouraged to in invite people to fundraise for you to help you out. All right, so thank you guys so much. Um, I don't even know what time it is. It is almost 4.30, so we're about half an hour over. Um, if you guys have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to me at lynda at mightycause.com. I'm happy to chat through this with you and offer my support. Um, and stay safe out there, um, happy fundraising, and try your best to get through this. The nonprofit sector perseveres. That's what you have always done and you will continue to do. Thanks and have a great day.